Hey everybody, it's Mike for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sockwave Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, International War Ring, Arthur Mia Molson ZM, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We're here with a terrific multi-talented lady who's a writer, producer, actor with extensive film experience in film, TV, theater, and the new media. She's been in uh, Jesus Cat or How I Accidentally Joined a Cult, which is really cute. Sin and Lyle, 22, and also the Judas Kiss Scandal Seal Team. She also appeared in Masha No More without a net and also the um galactica galaxy and star trek odyssey the the bright sessions and a lot more and she's uh won numerous awards in film fest and uh and and this new film that's out right now which basically tells the story of a young girl who learns of her mother's survival of the tokyo firebombing in march of 1945 through the eyes of her uh, brother's spirit and inspired by the little known lives of the of, of her uh maternal grandparents and live ladies and gentlemen of plus studios in beautiful downtown portland oregon the multi a writer producer actor with extensive film experience and also new media and talks about the new movie dragonfly ladies and gentlemen the multi-talented julia morizawa julia good morning good afternoon good evening thanks for joining us today <laughs> good all those things thank you for having me which well, great to have you on board as well two nice see dragonflies just floating around wanting to get in on the the fun so we can let them in too so yeah <laughs> And so you have had extensive film experience as a writer, producer, actor, also in new media as well, too. And uh, you've been in Jesus Cat or how accidentally joined a cult, Sin and Lyle, also 22, Judas Kiss, Scandal, Seal Team, Masha No More, Without a Net, and also uh, Galactica Galaxy, Star Trek Odyssey, and The Bright Sessions. You won numerous awards, a number of film fests, and um, you have a new movie called, called Dragonfly, telling the story of a young girl who... Um, basically um just um learns of her mother's spirit uh, of the tokyo uh, firebombing back in 1945 through the eyes of the brother spirit inspired by little known lives of your maternal grandparents and before getting all that julia tell us how i first got started wow okay wow um let's see uh Okay. I grew up as a competitive gymnast mm, <laughs> until okay. until I was maybe about 12 or 13 and I quit gymnastics and I don't know how long how much time passed but at some point um uh my dad was like so what are you going to do now? <laughs> 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 like now what? Um and uh I had a friend who was very active in the drama club. Uh, I want to say this was still middle school, but it might have been the beginning of high school. Mm -hmm. And I, I I just asked her, I was like, so like, do you like that? Like, what do you do? Is it fun? And she just raved about it. She was like, it's so much fun. I love doing it. Nice. And so in high school, I joined the drama club and I got into theater and mm -hmm. I was doing high school theater and community theater. And, uh, you know, the rest they say is history. I got the bug. I started off primarily acting and I got the bug. And then I moved to Los Angeles on my 18th birthday. Oh, um, wow. That's a good birthday <laughs> gift. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was nuts. I still remember the visual of being dropped off in a youth hostel on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, on my 18th birthday and just watching uh it was like my sister and her young son at the time just kind of watching them walk away from the glass door you know oh my god as Happy they dropped me off <laughs> yeah exactly oh probably gosh, crying yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so um i was in los angeles primarily pursuing acting for about 18 years but during that time from pretty early on uh you know, enough people tell you, hey, if you want, um, if you want to play the roles you want to play and tell the stories you want to tell, you you kind of need to write and produce them yourself. Just just FYI, here's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so I started uh, self-producing projects pretty early on, and um, you know, just kind of been trucking at it uh, since ever since then. Mm -hmm. And what was that one precise moment that simply influenced you into what you do in the rest of your career? A one precise moment that simply said, this is what I'm going to do. It, it would have been in high school. I feel like it may have been uh, being involved in an actual, all a, a teen, so like a youth uh, production of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, one of the directors on that was somebody who I always called my theater dad, uh, Mark Summers, who um, is is still uh, in the Oregon area. Um, I'm not sure if he's doing a lot of theater still, but um, being in that production, I think, was kind of like the, ooh, uh, this is fun. I love this. Uh, can I do this professionally or as a career or, you know, more so <laughs> once I grow up and become an adult. Mm -hmm. and, and here you are today. You pretty much follow your dream as well, too. And who are some of your favorite um, actors and, um, and and also your favorite directors and uh, favorite movies growing up? Ooh, um, I would say favorite movie. And I actually think I can still say to this day, it's my favorite movie is The Princess Bride. Oh, it's um, a great movie. It's my wife's favorite. Yes. And um, oh, 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 what was it? Um, As You Wish. Yes. And, you know, it's. I remember I had like a VHS tape of a, a copy of it that I think was recorded off, off of the television. So, you know, I would pop that in as a kid. And then once it was done, you'd hit the rewind button and then just start it again. But every once in a while, maybe every three years realistically now um i'll watch it again and it still holds up uh, it still holds up like i don't think it feels dated at all at least <laughs> not in the, not in the way that some like late 80s movies mm -hmm. feel i was like this still this still feels good mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, it's pretty much a timeless classic you could say that and what what was your favorite scene or favorite line from the movie um uh i often quote um no more rhymes. I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? <laughs> I don't know why that's always the one that comes to my mind. And of course, yeah. here comes Pablo Montoya goes, I yeah. Pablo, and you're going to die. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I, I definitely remember that. My wife really loves that movie. It's so great. How about some of your favorite uh, actors and directors growing up? Uh, um. I would say <laughs> one of my bigger influences, which you could see in my work, which is uh, related to The Princess Bride, is Christopher Guest, because um, one of the movies you uh, refer to Jesus Cat or how I accidentally joined a cult is entirely inspired by Christopher Guest films. It was a super like no budget mockumentary um, the, that was done entirely through improvisation with like a, a, a rough outline of the story. But um, I co-created that with my best friend, uh, Shayna Vorspan, and we would, in prepping it, like we'd be like making props and like costumes and we'd be watching Christopher Guest movies um, to get inspiration for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so definitely a big inspiration there. And I feel like every time people ask me the actor or actress question, I always go back to Natalie Portman. Um, I just feel like she's kind of flawless in everything she does. Oh, Star Wars <laughs> movies, that's the, that's the first thing that comes to mind, Star Wars. Sure, yeah, and she uh, she uh, she did good. You know, she, I mean, she can cross genres and still, I don't know, yeah. I just always feel like, wow, how did she do that sort of thing when I watch mm -hmm. her? And certainly did as well, too. You've been other ones. You already talked about uh, Jesus Cat. You've also been in Sin and Lyle, 22, Judas Kiss, and more. And um, before we talk about Dragonfly with um, Julia Morizawa, first of all, you listen to The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. It's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international war ring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. Takes place in four countries two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those who love be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews. And Eve Levin endorsed by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Riley, and Benoist. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia. 
available on Amazon. Also, check out The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com or 40 podcast platforms. Heard in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also on Apple, Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and more. And take us with you on any mobile device. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out The Mike Wagner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Weiner Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once and Wrinkles. Also t-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and some more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. And support the Mike Weiner Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Weiner Show.com. Here with the multi talented writer, producer, actor with extensive film experience in the film, TV, theater industry, and new media, Julia Morizawa here on the Mike Weiner Show. Before I talk about the latest project, Dragonfly, we already talked about the Jesus Cat. If you want to talk more about that's fine. You've also been in Sin and Lyle 22, Judas Kiss, Scandal, Seal Team. Masha No More, Without a Net, and the list goes on and on, even uh, Star Trek, Odyssey, Galactica, Galaxy, and Bright Sessions. Tell us about those. Uh, well, let me think. Um, I guess first and foremost, because it's the freshest on my mind, is Dragonfly. Um, that is the project that's um, currently on the festival circuit. It's my most recent project, despite me having uh, began pre-production on that in 2019. So it, it has been a little bit of a journey during the pandemic as well. But um, So Dragonfly is an animated short film. Like you mentioned, it's about the Tokyo firebombing of March 9th through 10th, 1945. It is inspired by the lives of my maternal grandparents who I never met. And oh, wow. um, what sort of inspired the story was in my early 20s, I got the bug to start researching my family heritage. And one of the first things I did was interview my parents, and just ask them whatever questions I could think of. And one thing I asked my mom at that time was if she knew what her parents may have experienced during World War II, like where they were, what they were doing. And she said basically no, she had no idea, except she had once heard that during the war, at some point, her parents were living in Tokyo, but then there was a big fire and they had to move back to the family farm in Komodo, in the country. So um, that was like the extent of the interview. And then at some point later, I was sort of taking all this information and starting to like outline uh, a story, a screenplay um, with this information. And I just Googled uh, like Tokyo fire 1945, like what mm -hmm. could that have been? And um, I had never heard of the fire bombing before. And there were there were uh, well over 100 fire bombings during that time. But um, this one was the most destructive for the a single night and um i was surprised because initially i'm thinking oh you know like a building caught on fire like you know people's houses burned down so they had mm -hmm. to leave i wasn't thinking you know napalm filled incendiary bombs uh wiping out you know a big chunk of the city and so that was the first time i had heard about that and i was motivated by the fact that i was an adult and that was the first time i had heard about that and I was like, that seems like such a big, important, tragic part of history to have never, ever, ever, ever heard about it. And um, I, I want to share that story. You know, I want to share um, about the event and the uh, uh, potentially what people who survived that may have experienced, you know, before it's entirely forgotten or it's wiped from history or history repeats itself and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, so that one, uh, it premiered in May of this year and it's had a few festival screenings and hopefully next year there will be more. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk about the Tokyo bombings and um, all the hundreds of fire bombings going on, but that was the most significant as well too and um of course you know being the biggest you know wiped out you know hundreds according to the um how, how you described it how far was that away from um the uh the, the big uh a-bomb dropping oh i you know what i don't know my geography so um the atom bomb was in hiroshima and nagasaki and uh i i actually unfortunately cannot tell you 
geographically uh, where those are. In comparison to Tokyo, they're both still in the southern half of Japan, but um, I've never been to either. So I'm really, I don't know. I would have to Google it, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, everybody remembers that too, and the firebombing as well, too. And of course, you know, you have people jumping off. And how, how did they manage to survive? You know, some survived, and um, how they manage and, um, you know, you know, you know, how they rebuild their lives and go from there. Sure. I mean, there, uh, part of my research was reading about um, the accounts of survivors who um, did were able to rebuild their lives. And um, one of the things that uh, you kind of see represented in the film is during the firebombing, people found shelter. Well, there were there were bomb shelters, but people found shelter like in, in ditches that had been dug specifically for in case this happens, and then also in the river underwater. So staying low to the ground and um, kind of hunkering down for the night. And um, I don't, because uh, the story is inspired by my grandparents, but I, I never met them. We never had this conversation. My mom never had this conversation with them. The experience represented in the film is sort of like uh, a mix of all the different research that I did of what could have happened and how they could have survived um, to, to make it out the next morning. Mm -hmm. And what was the significance of the dragonfly and also especially the name of it? What was the major significance of it? There's um, uh, the dragonfly historically has had sort of a important um, like metaphorical representation in Japan uh, for a few different reasons that I read about. But one is it represents transformation and rebirth. It also represents it uh, sort of like a strong war um, creature mm -hmm. because it it uh, it like only flies forward. It like never supposedly it never retreats, so it only goes forward and never backs up. Um, and it's also uh, representative of the farmland in Japan because you find it uh, a lot in the farmland um, where which is like represented in like my mom my mom's family farm. But it all started like that's sort of like the metaphorical stuff. Mm -hmm. It all started because one of the other stories my mom told me when I had interviewed her is when she was a kid, she used to play on her parents' farm and she would capture dragonflies. Oh, wow. OK. And I learned much later, like recently, like earlier this year, I asked her about that again. I asked for more information about that. And she clarified that she would actually um, cut off their wings. Really? She would what? capture she would capture dragonflies and cut off their wings because she loved them so much so they couldn't fly away. She would build houses for them and feed them. But then they, <laughs> and and apparently they survived. They really? survived like little pets, but they just couldn't fly away. And um, yeah, she's she's very much now like, "Well, I was a kid. I didn't know that I was torturing them." But um that's like where the whole like visual initially begin is just based off of my my mom's story of the things she used to do when she was a kid mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the crops that were being uh, grown on the farm um as far as i know it was like mostly rice uh because obviously that's that was a big crop um but also they did a lot of vegetables as far as i know like potatoes and onions and and greens i think when i was there 2009 2009 mm -hmm. uh the farm is still there uh the land is a lot smaller because it's being developed it or at that time i mean that was so long that was like over 10 years ago now um you know just like a lot of parts of the world it was being developed so their farmland was a lot smaller um but they were still serving us like fresh uh vegetables from mm. the farm yeah. Oh my gosh, you're making me hungry already. And um, how beneficial or destructive were the dragonflies on your farm? That I don't know. I don't know. I've never asked, and I don't even know if my mom would know that since she was just a kid when she was there. Mm hmm. And, and, and of course, you know, we're learning all about that as well, too. And of course, you know, you know, interviewing people. And uh, what are some of the other stories that you also got from the survivors as part of Dragonfly? 
Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I had uh, read or researched um, basically involved a lot of, uh, you know, separation of families. Um, one of the common uh, experiences you read about was women, um, right, this is wartime. So a lot of the civilians that were in Tokyo at the time were women, children, the elderly, and then men who couldn't go to the front lines. So one of the really unfortunate uh, stories y you can kind of read about a lot is um, women carrying their babies on their backs when they left the house and then reuniting with their families and the baby is not there anymore. And oh, wow. multiple accounts of, um, you know, survivors sort of being like, and we, we never talked about that. <laughs> like mom, you know, mom came back, we found mom, but the baby wasn't there and we didn't ask her and we never talked about it, mm -hmm. you know? And that's another big part of the film that, you know, I wanted to explore. Cause that was also my mother, my mother's experience was like her parents never talked about it. Um, which, uh, as far as I've heard from other people's experiences, is pretty common for war survivors or survivors of big trauma. Um, they don't necessarily share their experiences with their kids. And um, so you have this sort of like generational trauma that gets passed down, but uh, nobody really uh, knows exactly why. And, um, and eventually, after, you know, three, four generations, it kind of gets forgotten. So that was uh, another reason that I wanted to tell this story. Mm -hmm. and, and also, um, you know, how long did it take, uh, you know, right from the firebombing to uh, getting back to normal? How long did it take, you know, you know, from the firebombing where it's like you got rebuilt, replant and everything else? How long did it take to um, get back to normal? I, I mean, by, by accounts of uh, survivors we talked to, it's like, you know, yeah. how long did it take for them to uh, get back to normal? Like, say, you know. You rebuild the farm, you replant the crops, and if you had cattle or whatever it is, you just, you know, just, um, you know, rebirth the cattle and rebuild houses and, you know, so clean up the mess and everything. How long did it take uh, to uh, get back to normal? As far as I remember, in Tokyo specifically, I it took, I want to say, like, well into the 60s, maybe the 70s, because what happened after the war is uh i like it's like don't quote me specifically on this but the government basically allowed um just the citizens to just build as they could it, it, like if you can rebuild your house go ahead and do it which is why even today they say um if you go in in tokyo for example th this you know a lot of times the streets are not the streets are not um parallel it's not like specific it doesn't it's not zoned it's not zoned construction mm -hmm. right every building next to each other is slightly different and um that is still like remnants of rebuilding after the war just if you can just do it if you have wood just do it and rebuild your own house but i i'm as far as i remember reading it took you know at least a generation or two and potentially like some would argue you know still like there's still like those those um, remnants of of the war and the rebuilding of that. Mm -hmm. in, it, it, in sounds like have, it sounds like you have a benevolent government, not where it's just like they tell you when to do it, how to do it and everything else. It's like, you know, hey, hey, do what you can. That's what. what yeah. Sounds like. like no one, no one. I mean, the government couldn't wasn't capable of helping at that time. Like there was there was just there were so few resources and, uh, you know, uh, just a lot of uh, not a lot, not a lot of survivors. Um, so yeah, it was just like, just do what you can. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you want people to uh, learn from this film or get from it? Right, no, uh, it's kind of twofold. I want um, one uh, sort of education, awareness um, for those of us who uh, are not familiar with this time in history so that um, this, the, those who are involved um, aren't sort of like forgotten forever, but also uh, with the idea that, so history doesn't repeat itself. <laughs> so we can learn um, from these these times in history. And then the other side is, uh, you know, I hope that if people watch it and if they can relate that, 
you know, maybe it'll inspire them to go home and talk to their parents or their grandparents if they never have and sort of ask them about their life uh, back in the day. And um, so that, you know, we sort of um, maintain our, our family history as as the generations grow older and and are no longer around. Mm-hmm. That is really interesting. Where can we find the movie at? Uh, so nowhere publicly right now as it's still in the festival circuit. So I have to wait until it's done with that before I can just sort of release it online. Um, but uh, once the festival circuit is done, uh, it will most likely have it available somewhere online. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, what's your website and how do people reach you? Um, so you can check out the film website at dragonflyshortfilm.com. You can also just find me as under my name, Julia Morizawa.com. And then there's social media and like direct contact information on my personal website. All right. Well, certainly check that out. What's coming up for uh, Julie Morizawa in 2024? We'll find out just one minute. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mia Muslin Zia Missing. We'll be back with the multi talented Julie Morizawa of Dragonfly. After this time, we're back with uh, Julia Morizawa, the Mike Wagner Show with Dragonfly and just a few more things. What else can we expect me in 2024 and beyond, Julia? Ooh, um, so I, I have a, a couple more projects in development. I can't say that they'll be available by 2024. It might be a little bit longer than that, but I oh, do that's have. that's okay. At least we get an idea. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I mentioned how Dragonfly is like uh, inspired by my, my maternal grandparents. So my paternal grandparents, they met at Heart Mountain um, internment camp during the war in America. So I have another short in development that focuses on my paternal grandfather, um, still in early stages, uh, in discussions with um, a potential friend, potential co-producer to get that one off the ground. And then I also um, have a feature in development that, uh, again, early talks with producers and a director about getting that one off the ground. So I'm keeping it vague for now. Um, And then my hope is that uh, Dragonfly will be screened at more festivals throughout 2024. So it'll be available then. We will certainly check that out as well too. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Hmm. I... I kind of want to say, I want to say my sister. (laughs) So she's always been like my biggest influence, like in life. Mm -hmm. And so that um, happens. Uh, Her name is Sandra Morizawa. And I don't know if she would appreciate uh, me saying that, but it's not like she will listen to this most likely. (laughs) (laughs) You never know. I know. know. Actually, she could be somebody in a family that could be watching this. You never know. Yeah. Someone distant that you may not even know about. You never know. They always, my family does always surprise me because I'll like post this stuff on social media or like I'll drop them like a group email, like, ah, here's this stuff. And nobody will talk about it. Nobody will respond. But then like two weeks later, they'll be like, oh yeah, like that thing you did. I watched that. I was like, oh, you did. Okay, great. Um, (laughs) But yeah, uh, uh, just my sister, I just feel like she is an incredibly hard worker and she's kind of like in a lot of ways she's like the caretaker of the family like um she she really uh in a lot of ways she she was like the person she's 10 years older than me so she was like the person that raised me when I was a kid Mm -hmm. and then um you know and then went off to college and then I was heartbroken for like the next 10 years (laughs) but um yeah I don't know she's just always she's always been my best friend and always been uh you know, somebody I look up to. And I, I just feel like, especially with her, her attitude of like hard work and, and, and also, you know, she, she had a family when she was pretty young and just like her ability to balance family with career, which is something I'm still figuring out and still really struggling with. And I'm sure she struggled with it too, but from Mm -hmm. the outside perspective, like she just handled that stuff so well. (laughs) Um, So I I don't know. She's just kind of always been my biggest inspiration in life. 
maybe she can uh, watch Dragonfly with you and uh, get that figured out. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Um, do what you love. Yeah, mm -hmm. do what you're passionate about. Um, no matter what, uh, if you love it, then then um, you should be doing it. And you're meant to do it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good answer as well, too. Once again, we're with the multi-talented Julian Moriazawa of Dragonfly here on the Mike Widener Show. Julian, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Live have you back. Once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your works? So, so go to my website at juliamorizawa.com. You can find links to like everything I've ever done on there. It's like a little public diary. Um, but there's also <laughs> contact information. There's social media links. And then uh, you can also find the link to Dragonfly on there if it's just easier. But for the film itself, it's dragonflyshortfilm.com. All right, well, certainly check that out. Once again, Julia, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. Wish you all best. And Julia, you definitely have a great future to have you. <laughs> thank you so much.